So I think we're pretty well on time at the minute. And uh, have we got Lottie here? There's Lottie. We might just, you if you're ready to help. start maybe a minute early, we might move on to the next section, which is looking more specifically at radiation therapy treatments. So Lottie is a medical physicist at the Alfred Hospital here in Melbourne. And uh, she's going to be telling us about work being done looking at ruthenium plaques, um, actually on a world program, looking at how to use uh, ruthenium plaques most effectively for my melanoma. Thanks very much, Lottie. Thank you, Claire. Can you hear me okay? Awesome. Um, thank you for the introduction and thank you to AOMA for inviting me to give this talk. It is a joy to be here, even though it is just virtually, um, and a particular joy to be talking to you about the Global Ruthenium Eye Applicator Practice Survey. So ESTRO, of course, is a European Society for Radiation Oncology, and one of ESTRO's many subcommittees is Brefis QA, which is short for Brachytherapy Physics Quality Assurance. It sounds vivid, doesn't it? Uh, one of the subcommittees underneath Brefis QA, in turn, is the Working Party Number 22, which is dedicated to working with ocular brachytherapy. Uh, these are the members of working party number 22. And you can see that we um, are spread across quite a lot of clinics with quite a lot of plaque experience. Um, you possibly can't see that we, even though this is a physics committee, we do have a member who is a radiation oncologist. Dr. Luca Tagliaferri works out of the Gemelli Clinic in Rome, which is the Italian National Referral Center for Plaque Brachytherapy. We also have a couple of members uh, from uh, Ecker and Siegler, the manufacturer that sells ruthenium eye plaques, and both Luca and the vendors have made an incredibly good contribution to the work that we've done. In our working party, once we started talking about ruthenium plaque bracket therapy, we realized that there is a very large variation in clinical practice in pretty much any aspect of how you might choose to do plaque bracket therapy, and we thought a useful first thing to do would be to um, do a survey to map practice. We spoke to our vendor colleagues and they told us that there's only about 100 clinics worldwide that do ruthenium plaque brachytherapy. And for that reason, we thought we'd make the survey global rather than just European. We chose to use SurveyMonkey because Estro has a commercial account with them that we could use. And for reasons I'd be happy to talk about. Otherwise, um, we, took, we decided to make one survey for the physician involved. Typically, that would be the ophthalmologist, but in some clinics, like Gemelli Clinic, that might be the radiation oncologist, and a separate survey for the physicists. Uh, we chose to use what we like to call a multi-pronged distribution approach, uh, symbolized by that Swiss army knife on the right there. And what that means is just that we tried in all the possible ways that we can think of to get in touch with possible responders to get them to tell us what they did. Our survey opened on the 1st of March this year. And um, as of, ah, this is my favorite slide, um, the slide is slightly old, it's showing your data from May, but as of yesterday, we had 76 responses from physicians to our survey and 75 responses to physicists. This map gives you an indication of the people who responded to us. Um, the red pins are um, physicians and the green pins are physicists. And in Northern Europe, where the countries are small and close together, the physicians are shown on top of the physicists, so there's a whole bunch of responses that you can't see. There's one pin per country, even though we have had multiple responses from that country. And you can see that although Europe is the main driver of ruthenium plaque brachytherapy, there are quite a lot of other centers. We've had responses from Cairo, from Brazil, from Johannesburg, uh, from places that I certainly didn't know did plaque brachytherapy. It's absolutely fascinating. And what I'd like to spend the rest of this very short time slot on is to share with you a sneak preview of our survey results. Before we get into the results, a really quick word of warning. Um, this is an intermediate data analysis. There are at least three test responses in each survey that haven't had their data removed. Um, none of the data has been excluded yet. We'll probably exclude a couple of surveys because they didn't have a lot of information in them. And there may be errors that I've introduced because no one's done any independent checking of this. So just things to bear in mind um, when we go and look at the data. And it's absolutely fascinating. We asked our physicians when their clinic started doing ruthenium plaque brachytherapy. And what they said is shown in this timeline. So you've got the year along the horizontal axis. A short red line means one clinic started that year. A line that's twice as long means two clinics started that year. And we've got two years with three clinics and two years with four clinics. 
And what you can see on, on this is that really the majority of clinics that do it, or at least that responded to our survey, have started doing ruthenium plaque brachytherapy in the last 20 years or so. But there are a couple of clinics that have very mature practice. The earliest responder is 1966, and you might wonder where they got their plaques from at that point. That's a discussion we can have if, if anyone's interested. Um, we also asked our clinicians what sort of plaques they had available in their clinics. And on the left of this slide, you can see the plaques that can be purchased from Eckert and Siegler, the small ones for retinoblastoma, the bigger ones that are circular, and then the ones with the cutouts for the optic nerve and the iris. And on the right, you can see the kind of plaques that people said they had access to. And you can see that the best sellers, perhaps unsurprisingly to the plaque um, surgeons in the audience, are the CCA and CCB plaques. But really, the, the, the rest of the plaques are pretty much all, with the exception of the CDE that nobody likes, all the plaques are in use. And the plaques in use vary very considerably from clinic to clinic. There wasn't a clear pattern about which clinics would work. So there's a huge amount of variation in what is deemed um, useful in the different clinics. Absolutely fascinating. We asked our clinicians how many patients they treat on an annual basis in their plaque clinic, and their answer is shown in this histogram. And you can see in the first bar that 10 clinics treat 10 or fewer patients per year, so possibly not a clinic that builds up a lot of experience very quickly. You can see that the majority of clinics treat less than 50 patients per year. And then there's a couple of heavyweight outliers at the top end of this graph, treating more than 150 patients per year. The, the largest clinic treats about 250 patients per year. Centers, no doubt, of great experience. And I think also, knowing who they are, centers that do quite a lot of training of ophthalmologists um, in their daily work. We asked our clinicians which treatment options they had available for patients with ocular melanoma. And this is what they said. Almost all the clinics did enucleation, obviously, and plaques. A couple of lovely ophthalmologists responded to the survey, even though they don't do plaque therapy anymore. And that's why that's not 100%. You can see that most of them had access to external beam radiotherapy, um, TTT and PDT as well. About 30% of them can access proton therapy. And then there's a gamma knife and a couple of other things in there. I think the main take home point from this slide is that most of the clinics have multiple treatment options available to the clinicians to choose from when they refer their patients and decide what, what treatment modality is suitable for their patient. And of course, the really fascinating thing then becomes how do they choose? And we asked the, clin the clinicians to say roughly which fraction of patients receives which treatment. And this is not all the data. This is just showing you seven clinics fairly at random. And it's shows you a breakdown of um, what percentage of patients is offered what. <laughs> so from this, we learned that not everybody can add up to 100, but we also see a huge variation. I think. If you just look at the three or the two red boxes here, this is three clinics that all have access to ruthenium and iodine therapy. And look at the variation. Clinic number 16 refers half of its patients to iodine monotherapy, whereas clinic 17 only refers 5% and 68% of them go off and have ruthenium. That's a huge variation for the same treatment options. And no doubt this reflects physician preference, possibly patient preference, possibly practicality, possibly reimbursement, and a whole heap of other things. I regret we didn't ask more detail about this. Um, if you include more data, you just see more variation in this. One of the interesting things, of course, is proton therapy. And three of these clinics offer proton therapy. And again, you can see the variation. Clinic 13 offers 5% of their patients proton therapy. In clinic number seven, it's 20%. There's one clinic in this that offers at least 40% of their patients proton therapy as their first choice. So a huge amount of variation, no doubt, um, underlying a, um, a variety of factors. We asked the physicians, too, what radiation dose they prescribe to their patients. And that is particularly fascinating to me as a physicist. Most of the physicians prescribe the apical dose, so the dose to the top of the tumor. And on the left-hand side of this slide, you can see the apical dose prescriptions. You can see that the most popular prescription is 100 gray to the apex, chosen by 18 clinics. The second most popular one is 85 gray, probably from the comms trial, chosen by seven clinics. Three clinics like 130 gray to the apex, and then there's a whole heap of other numbers that are done by just one clinic. Um, on the right, you can see the clinics that like to prescribe base and apex dose, so the, the, the dose to the top and the bottom of the tumor. And not two clinics have the same uh, parameters on that one. They have all got a different preferred base and apex dose that they told us about. 
There was one clinic that um, likes to prescribe 100 grade to a height of six mils, no matter how big the tumor is, that's a bit of an outlier. In the world of radiation oncology, it's staggering that there is such a variation in what people prescribe, and it in part reflects the fact that there are no guidelines to exactly how much radiation dose we should be prescribing in the first place. It's particularly fascinating because we actually happen to know just how the likely tumor control varies with the apical dose, and here it is. You know that if you give the apex about 80 gray, then your tumor control probability at three years sits on around about 80 percent. If you increase that to about 130 gray, well, then your tumor control probability is closer to 90 percent. So this is all things that obviously our clinicians bear in mind when they choose their prescription doses. Tumor control isn't everything. There's toxicity as well, but it's fascinating that there is such a broad variation of prescription doses. At least I think there is. We asked our clinicians if they like to sew a stitch across the plaque to keep it close to the eye. It's called a mattress stitcher by some. And again, 18 people said, nope, 10, 10 people said absolutely. And then we had a whole heap of intermediate answers um, with people doing it sometimes and not always. Some people expressed their strong opinions by writing always followed by exclamation marks in the text box. We had a text box available to every single question so that people were allowed, were able to leave um, more details and comments. Again, the variation is fascinating here. We asked the clinicians whether patients are inpatients or outpatients um, when they have their radioactive plug attached to them. And the vast majority of clinics treat their patients as inpatients, but there is a small handful of clinics that treat their patients as, as outpatients. And even though um, by sending them home, and even though this survey is anonymous, I can tell you that the clinics that treat their patients as outpatients are not all in the same country, but they are in countries that are quite close to each other geographically. So whether there's a bit of uh, local consensus building going on there, possibly. And then we've got some, some comments on the right there. And if you sit down and calculate the dose that a spouse might get from uh, being close to um, somebody with a ruthenium plaque, you could actually get have a scenario where the partner um, of somebody with a plaque might get close to the annual dose limit if these patients are treated as um, outpatients and are sent home. We asked our clinicians if the hospital is reimbursed for the treatment in such a way that all of their expenses are covered. And we had a whole heap of interesting answers. 22 clinics said yes, 10 said no. There's a couple more yeses. A couple of people didn't know, and one person um, said not all. Um, and, and one lovely person, my heart bleeds for him, says, we are a public hospital, I wish, that's the top right. And um, so again, quite a big variety of answers on this one. I'm almost out of time, so I'll just finish with um, my favorite question to the survey, I think, which is, is there anything about your clinical practice that you would like to change? Um, quite a few people said no. A few people said yes without saying what it was, so that was a bit less helpful. Um, but there's a, and, and this isn't showing you every single answer that we had. That would take three slides just for this question, but it gives you a rundown of some of it. And there's a lot of things that people would like to change. I'm seeing quite a lot of thoughts on changes to practice that would be beneficial. And um, responder number two is quite happy. He can choose himself. Some people would like more plaques. Some people would like better access to surgery, uh, surgical theatres. Um, and some people would like to do proper image-based planning. One of the questions I haven't shown you is we asked the physicists how the treatment planning is done and more than 80% of clinics are using an Excel spreadsheet rather than the image-based planning that we would use in pretty much every other part of radiation oncology. And with that, I would like to thank you. And um, I think questions at the end, is that right? That sounds good. Um, thanks, Lottie. Uh, so next we're going to hear from Dr. Amanda Dacia, uh, who has a PhD in high energy particle physics from UC Berkeley uh, and currently works at uh, the Mayo Clinic in Rochester. So thanks very much. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at today's summit. My name is Amanda Deicher, and I'm a medical physicist in radiation oncology at Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. I'd like to discuss adding gantry-based proton therapy to your radiotherapy toolkit. I have no disclosures. By way of introduction, I'll briefly review the three main radiotherapy options for the treatment of ocular tumors brachytherapy plaques, which we just heard discussed by the previous speaker, 
stereotactic radiosurgery with a photon system such as a gamma knife, and proton therapy. Within proton therapy, there are two main delivery approaches for ocular targets, and I'll discuss both. And since we've gone the gantry route at my institution, I'll spend the last portion of the talk discussing our implementation at Mayo Rochester. As I mentioned, there are three primary modalities for treating ocular melanoma. Shown here are all three applied to the same tumor, outlined in red. The doses are shown as a percentage of prescription and color wash. The orange level corresponds to prescription or 100%. The red highlights regions of higher dose where higher dose is greater than 120% of prescription. And the blue is the lower dose or 10% of prescription. All three modalities deliver full dose to that target, but the prescription changes with modality because there are delivery times are different. Plaques deliver radiation continuously over their four days of application to a full dose of 65 gray. Because SRS is a single treatment, uh, the dose here is 25 gray, and proton therapy is often delivered in say four to five fractions for a total of 50 to 60 gray. Let's look in a little more detail at the dose distributions. For brachytherapy plaques, the radioactive sources are adjacent to the sclera, so the highest doses are seen in the sclera. At my institution, we use iodine-125 sources, and in this example, the dose to the sclera is four times the prescription dose in order to get full coverage to the full tumor height. Let's consider the dose along the red arrow drawn on the left image. If we lay that red arrow out along the x-axis on the right and plot the dose on the y-axis, we see that one over r squared rapid dose fall off. That fall off combined with the internal shielding of the plaque itself does keep the dose confined to the involved eye. Photon SRS uses many small x-ray beams from many directions, all aimed at the target. The target is caught in the crossfire, so to speak, and receives the highest doses, but there is a small amount of entry and exit dose smeared around to the surrounding tissues. At my institution, we use a gamma knife for this procedure for some tumors. That same red arrow is drawn from the sclera towards the nose tip on the left image, and we look at the dose profile on the right. We see on the right that the center of the target receives 200% of the prescription dose in order to get full target coverage and the steepest part of the dose gradient is right at the tumor boundary. Proton beam therapy typically uses a single anterior beam as shown here, though some institutions will use two or three. One nice thing about a proton beam is that protons of a known energy will travel a known distance in water, losing a little energy along the way, but depositing most of their energy or dose near the end of their paths. There is no exit dose, so the uncolored areas are really getting zero dose in this image. I've changed the direction of the arrow on the left image, but looking at the corresponding dose profile on the right, you can see there is a sharp lateral dose fall off and a relatively flat top, meaning uniform dose to the target. There are two ways one could construct a proton center that is capable of treating ocular tumors. The long established method is to use a fixed beam room, by which I mean there is a single lateral proton nozzle extending from one of the walls. The patient is in a seated position with their head immobilized in a full or partial mask specifically formed for them. A bite block can also help stabilize that position. The seat and the head immobilization is adjustable so that the patient can be brought to the beam. The fixed beam approach usually requires a dedicated room. I want to emphasize that ocular proton therapy started in fixed beam rooms and they have had excellent results. The pause comes when one is building a new center. The space such a room occupies and the shielding around it can occupy a significant amount of real estate. This additional equipment and space will increase the cost of a proton center. All proton centers today are being built with gantries where the nozzle rotates around the patient, allowing radiation oncologists to use the best beam angles for treating a target while minimizing dose to critical structures. It is possible to use these same gantry rooms to treat ocular targets. The setup is actually very similar to other cranial targets. The patient would lie supine on the standard treatment couch, again immobilized with a mask and bite block constructed specifically for the patient. I've been a volunteer for this immobilization and there is no wiggle room. 
The advantage to the gantry-based approach is that it doesn't require an extra beam line or an extra room. After a small number of ocular patients would be treated, the multipurpose room could be utilized for head and neck, prostate, breast, sarcoma, literally any other site from head to foot, maximizing facility efficiency. However, the same caveat applies to, to both approaches. There is no off-the-shelf system that enables ocular treatments for fixed beam room or gantry-based treatments. But several centers are developing their own gantry-based solutions. For the remainder of this talk, I'll discuss what we're implementing at Mayo Clinic in Rochester. Mayo Clinic Synchrotron produces protons with ranges between 4 cm and 32 cm, with 2 mm range spacing at low energy. To treat ocular tumors, a 45 mm range shifter will be inserted. Our single synchrotron supplies spot scanned penciled beams to four matched half gantries, shown on the right. Ocular treatments in these general purpose rooms will be similar to non-ocular treatments in many respects. Again, the patient will be immobilized head first supine on a six degree of freedom robotic couch and localized with a KV pair. The fixed panels can be seen in the lower photograph mounted to the ceiling while the x-ray tubes are in the floor. We've had to develop three new components specifically for ocular treatments. A mechanical aperture that mounts to the gantry nozzle, a gaze monitoring hardware and electronic system, and gaze gating software. The mechanical aperture holder has an aluminum base plate which slides into the extended range shifter slot in our nozzles. There is no metal distal to the base plate. The assembly consists of milled Delrin, plastic bolts, and fiberglass supports. The holder accepts 3D printed patient specific apertures shown in white, which are keyed for orientation and conical to eliminate streaming of protons in the gaps. There is essentially no flex, so this same assembly can be used for anterior and lateral beams, treating targets up to six centimeters deep and four centimeters in diameter. An adjustable gaze target and camera can move around an infrared illuminating ring. The ring itself is table mounted and can be adjusted to center over the track die. The ring can be raised and lowered quickly to accommodate the aperture mount. And the image in the right shows the patient's eye view if that patient were supine in our physics lab. The gaze gating software calculates the center of an elliptical pupil. The left image shows a reference that will be captured synchronously with an x-ray pair. The right image will be a live camera feed. The software will send a gate to the delivery system when the deviation is below a user specified threshold. Manual gating is also possible with a handheld device. So what does our pencil beam look like when it's been blown out by a 45 millimeter range shifter, allowed to spread for 30 centimeters, and then scraped by a six centimeter thick plastic aperture? The distal fall off is still a synchrotron sharp two millimeters. The lateral penumbra depends on the situation. For apertures up to tw two centimeters in diameter, we can use a single central spot position, so the scanning is only in depth. The penumbra in these cases is just over one millimeter, depending on the size of the aperture. For apertures greater than two centimeters in diameter, the central spot is helped by four corner spots, as shown by the stars in figure A. The spacing and weighting of these helper spots determine the lateral penumbra and the height of the peak and the cross field profiles shown in the bottom two plots. These plots also show the excellent agreement between film and Monte Carlo dose. The heavy use of helper spots makes a flatter distribution, but increases delivery times as more protons will be lost to the scraper and not delivered to the patient. I have a few quick slides on our anticipated workflow. We plan to immobilize the patient head first supine with a custom head cushion, a three point thermoplastic mask, and a bite block. The couch mounted gaze monitoring device will be used at the time of CT simulation to set the gaze angle. And since our treatment room couches have lower height limits, we'll have to ensure we don't build up patients too far off the couch table in simulation. The kyphotic patient in the lower right might not be the ideal candidate. For the radiation oncologists in the audience, although we use Eclipse as our treatment planning system for most non-ocular cases, its analytical dose calculation does not handle proton apertures. 
As a result, we start and end an eclipse, but the plan generation and dose calculation are done entirely outside ARIA. In particular, we use a custom MATLAB script to generate the treatment plans where the user inputs the proximal and distal tumor depth, the prescription, and if the aperture is larger than two centimeters in diameter, the relative weights and position of those helper spots. The resulting DICOM file is sent to Eclipse, but it is a quick stop only. Taking advantage of our normal planning workflow, a script in Eclipse sends the plan to a GPU cluster for an in-house Monte Carlo dose calculation. This dose is automatically imported into Eclipse for plan review, possible normalization, and this is the route to the Itachi delivery system. For the non-radiation audience members, this is to say that you have to give us at least a week, if not two, to get this plan turned around and be ready for treatment. For each patient, we will do extensive QA measurements to make sure that the dose delivered to the patient matches the dose you see on the CT scan. Patient-specific QA will include two measurements with the patient's aperture in place. First, there'll be an absolute dose measurement with a pinpoint chamber made in acrylic. And then to compare the shape and alignment of the aperture to the planned dose, we'll use radiochromic film sandwiched in a phantom with embedded BBs. The phantom will be aligned radiographically the same way as we would a patient, and the shadow of those BBs will determine the axes. The phantom and a sample film exposure are shown on right. On the day of treatment, we'll check the alignment of the mount in the designated treatment room, and the patient will be set up in a room with lateral and PAKV imagers to confirm gaze angle with a more intuitive orientation, and then transferred by robotic couch and gurney to the gantry rooms. Alignment will start with bony anatomy. We'll simultaneously capture a reference pupil position and a KV pair and translate to clips. After the MD inserts the eyelid retractors, we'll verify clip alignment and request beam with high priority. A single 12 gray beam can be delivered in less than two minutes, much less if the aperture is smaller. So far, we have conducted multiple trainings and procedure development sessions, but we don't yet have patient experience. We do have a growing list of items of concern to monitor. The reproducibility of SIM gaze angle, ease of alignment and its stability, appointment lengths, communication across departments, efficiency as we introduce a new procedure to a practice nearing capacity, and in all these details, being mindful of the patient's experience. We'll need a very, very patient first patient. I'd like to close by acknowledging my many colleagues at Mayo who have contributed to getting our ocular proton program so close to the finish line. In particular, our excellent division of engineering has been invaluable. Thank you for your attention. I'm looking forward to the live Q&A at the end of the session. Thanks very much, Amanda. As a radiation oncologist, I'm very interested in all of that, but we're gonna move on to Sachin's talk first. So it's my great pleasure to welcome Sachin Salvi, who's an ocular oncologist um, and clinical lead of the Sheffield Ocular Oncology Service in the UK. Um, he's been a member of that team, which will, he's been a member of the team that formulated the UK NICE uveal melanoma national guidelines and is heavily involved in uveal melanoma care in the UK, including treating patients with a whole range of radiation therapy modalities. And he's going to talk to us about patient selection in that setting. Thanks very much, Sachin. Thanks so much, Claire, for the lovely introduction and having me on this meeting. I hope you can hear me well. Sorry, yes, can it's all good. Yeah, yep, perfect, we can perfect, hear you and perfect, we can yeah. see your presentation. Awesome, that's great. Okay, um, so yeah, so uh, the remit of today's talk is focusing more on proton beam therapy. I really enjoyed the previous talk, uh, but giving our view on how we decide what treatment modality to use for which patients. The aim of any treatment when you think about uveal melanoma is to obviously treat the tumor so that it reduces the risk of metastasis, preserve vision, and then preserve the eye. So with these in mind, often when a patient comes in front of us, we'll decide what treatment to choose um, and also taking patients' wishes into consideration. Um, so 
here's a gamut of treatments we use in Sheffield. Um, and say, for example, if it's a small, medium sized IML, as Mandeep explained, indeterminate melanocytic lesion or a small melanoma, and it's often these are located close to the macular or amelanotic, then PDT would be our first go. Um, our main workhorse of treatment is obviously ruthenium plug bracket therapy, um, but we are limited by the fact that our biggest tumor, biggest plaque is 20 millimeters. So we treat a maximum diameter of 16 millimeters uh, of a melanoma to allow two millimeter margin around the tumor. And the maximum height we treat is up to six millimeters. And that's because the higher, the, you know, the, the, the more the height, the longer you need to leave the plaque on. So around six millimeters tumor, we have to keep the patient in for a week. And beyond that, we just think they're better option, treatment options. So in those patients, we'd either prefer proton beam therapy and stereotactic. And often that's the big question is which of these to choose for whom. Now, proton beam um, would be something I would choose if it's a larger tumor, not suitable for plaque, where the tumor is away from the disc. So there's a bigger chance of preserving vision. Uh, while if the tumor is closer to the disc, then stereotactic would be the one I'd lean towards. Um, and in patients who are not fit for general anesthetic, have comorbidities or want treatment straight away, then stereotactic single shot works very well in our hands. Uh, proton beam uh, does give vis better visual pres uh, preservation from the studies we've done in our group of patients. Um, but you have to be careful to select these patients well. As the previous presenter explained, there is a there's a lag, we have to put markers on and that all the couple of weeks of planning. So if some, if we find a tumor is rapidly growing, then, then I would suggest thinking of other options other than proton beam, just for the time it takes for us to actually deliver the treatment. And we find proton beam quite useful for anterior located tumors. We reserve enucleations clearly for really tumors, which we can't treat any other, any other way and rarely from patient choice. Uh, we used to do local resections, but we don't do those anymore uh, as we find that the results we were getting were not up to scratch. So in our group, um, we use ruthenium plaque as the mainstay and the rest really stereotactic 20%, proton beam 20%, enucleation 20%, um, and 5% patients get photodynamic therapy. So I'll go through a few examples of where we use these treatments. PDT, um, it's a non-thermal laser treatment. Um, each treatment's done for 83 seconds, 50 joules spot, and um, we, we, we apply around 100, 250 joules to the entire surface. And usually um, three sessions are given. So in some cases, we just give one sitting and then watch the patient. And often if there's a good response, we may not proceed with further uh, sittings. Uh, here's a classic patient with a slightly amelanotic lesion, very close to the fovea. You can see it's got uh, the features that Mandeep described to how to differentiate from a nevus. Um, and we felt like plaque bracket therapy would definitely wipe away vision if you're going to give two millimeter margin. So we've done photodynamic therapy and we've had an excellent response and the patient's done reasonably well um, with good visual, with good visual acuity, obviously they get some scotomas at uh, the area of treatment. Here's another amelanotic lesion close to the fovea, um, treated with photodynamic therapy. This one got a larger scar and though has, you know, probably around 618 vision, it didn't do as well. The one thing about PDT you have to be careful about is the high risk of recurrence. Um, so you have to really monitor them closely. Plug bracket therapy, um, as I said, this is our workhorse. Uh, you, we have to suture the plug onto the sclera. There are two types, as uh, John mentioned, ruthenium and iodine. Uh, we just use ruthenium in UK. Uh, it's a beta emitting isotope and it's silver shielded. And it's, re it's, you know, it's something that we can handle very well in theaters, a long half-life and um, economical in terms of comparison to other treatment modalities. And we've been getting excellent treatment uh, control rates. Um, there are complications as with radiation retinopathy, radiation optic neuropathy, scatrack, secondary glaucoma. Uh, and importantly, if a tumor is next to the disc, even though there are notch plaques available, we find that they don't do very well. So we avoid peripapillary tumors treatment with plaque bracket therapy. So surgically, we'll expose the tumor, uh, mark it with transillumination, 
Um, as you can see, uh, the tumor is marked with, with the light source. And on the right side, you can see the marked area. We'll cover that with a dummy, um, at making sure at least we've got two millimeter coverage. And then um, the dummy is sutured with uh, uh, sutured down to the sclera. And then once we're sure that it covers the whole tumor, we'll put the plaque on. And the patient then stays in for as many days as required to give the radiation dose. We go for 350 to the base and 85 to the apex. Um, and we get excellent results. This is an example of a plaque that's been put on for a peripheral tumor. Um, the superior rectus and lateral rectus have been hooked, transillumination done, and then the plaque placed. We try and place it slightly eccentrically if you're trying to save the patient's vision, so away from the fovea. Um, so, but minimum of two millimeters coverage towards the fovea, but a larger coverage away from it to the periphery. And you can see the, the thickness has reduced in size and so has the width of the tumor. We can use them for posterior pole tumors as well. In this case, we'd have to detach the inferior oblique a muscle. Uh, this tumor is already close to the fovea. It's a collis stud, and we've got excellent uh, reaction around the tumor. Uh, once you get this reaction, it's really, really unlikely the tumor will recur. And um, we monitored this patient for any radiation retinopathy or uh, problems such as that for in the future. Moving on to stereotactic radio surgery, we use single shot gamma knife um, and we really find them really useful in peripapillary tumors. In theory, you don't have an upper size limit, but clearly uh, we are restricted with um, issues such as um, you have to give local anesthetic peribulbar injections. So some patients may not like that idea of that. You need a frame put on. Um, we then do the planning. Once the frame's put on, the patient has a scan, we do the planning, um, decide you know, the radiation field and the treatments given 360 degrees we, where we get a, a targeted treatment to the tumor. Lots of advantages can be done as a day case and you know, the treatment itself is only 30 to 40 minutes compared to other treatments. And very useful for patients who are elderly, frail, and you want the treatment straight away without delay. And we get excellent control rates, but clearly um, um, it, it can treat patients who have extraocular extensions as well, or recurrent tumors, because we're getting, giving a wider field of radiation. Uh, but in our experience, the disadvantage is that um, along with the local anesthetic, it's really difficult to give stereotactic for an anteriorly located tumor in patients who have a wider AP diameter uh, of the skull because, you know, the way the radiation is given. And because we're often treating patients with tumors which are close to the optic disc means that there's a higher rate of secondary nucleation because of radiation optic neuropathy, glaucoma, uh, rubiosis. But it's, in our experience, it's, it's not far off from the proton beam secondary nucleation rate. So typically the tumor we treat with stereotactic are these peripapillary tumors. Um, again, it's wrapped around the optic nerve. Um, any treat, I mean, ruthenium in this case would definitely fail. We could do proton beam, but it would require insertion of markers. And that's quite difficult with such a posterior tumor and require general anesthetic and you know uh, a, a delay for us to send to Clatterbridge to the treatment. So single shot uh, stereotactic works beautifully. Um, and, uh, pres and helps preserve the eye and um, treat the tumor. This is a patient who has a 16 millimeter tumor, which is less than six millimeters in diameter. So we could have considered plaque treatment, but patients unfit, you know, and um, um, not fit for general anesthetic, um, frail, elderly. And um, again, in these patients, stereotactic seems to be uh, quite helpful in treating the tumor without causing too many comorbidities for the patient. Um, the tumor doesn't completely shrink. It does shrink with stereotactic, but not as much as with, uh, we see with, with uh, ruthenium plaque bracket therapy. Uh, here's a large peripheral tumor. Um, we've treat, it's got already got an extensive ex exudative retinal detachment, and after treatment, the detachment settled down. Um, it doesn't settle down in all all patients. We do get um, toxic tumor syndromes in rare in rare group of patients, but we see that more for some reason with proton than stereos. 
So that brings us to proton beam therapy. Um, uh, in UK, we've got the Cyclotron, Douglas Cyclotron Center at uh, Clatterbridge uh, Cancer Center. Um, and all the UK oncology centers would refer our patients uh, to them for the treatment. We do, once we have an MDT discussion, decided that proton beam is the treatment of choice for the patient. Uh, insert the clips, usually under general anesthetic, as shown in these photographs. The clips are placed around the tumor and they work as this guiding light for the proton beam to be delivered. Um, and really, it is an excellent tool because of this Black Peak effect where you can look, you know, focus the treatment onto the tumor. We use it, as I explained earlier, in tumors which are larger that we can't treat with block bracket therapy, um, but we want to try and preserve vision. Um, but really, if you find a tumor is rapidly growing, then we would avoid proton beam. What do we do? Well, a lot of data is collected at the time of surgery about, plaque, about the markers placement around the tumor. All that information is fed to the Clatterbridge team. They have a whole group of um, uh, physicists who will work on this on their iPlan software and make a pre-plan. Then the patient is brought in for simulation, uh, explained how the treatment is going to be done. Uh, immobilization, as uh, my colleague earlier mentioned, uh, with mouth bite or mask and then fixation is done. The plan is then made with sort of adding sort of wedges and, and, and in, in a way to try and, or notches to try and reduce the radiation dose to critical areas such as the nerve or the macula. And then the treatment after simulation is um, done with four treatment, uh, four fractions uh, giving around 58 gray compared to around 30 gray of stereotactic uh, that we currently give. There is a 2.5 millimeter margin to the tumor that's still delivered. Um, there are a lot of colleagues involved when we do stereo, when we do proton beam therapy, uh, lots of planning, sub signing off of plans, and then the treatment is then provided um, at Clatterbridge. So yeah, a couple of examples, uh, large tumors. Again, this one's got significant detachment and this patient's done very well after proton beam therapy. Um, it's useful for patients with larger extraocular extensions because we can mold the proton beam around it. Uh, it's a bilobed tumor in terms of the extraocular extension a little far away from the, uh, from the actual intraocular tumor. Um, so we transilluminate, uh, as you can see, tumor is identified, clips are placed all around the tumor. Um, there is a way of placing the clips, you know, uh, anatomically so as to not, not cause collisions with the physics of the treatment. And then a plan is made as in this uh, photograph. Um, you can notch around the macula um, and then wait um, with sort of lots of revisions, we then decide what, what best to treat. And this patient's done very well three years post proton beam uh, with a reasonably good vision. And what you can see is the tumor has shrunk only a little bit compared to ruthenium plaque, where it really shrinks a lot. Um, there's another example of proton beam where it's much anterior tumor with a ciliary body extension. Um, and we can then treat this with the same way, you know, there's a beam's eye view, there's, a, there's lots of different views to, to help us plan the treatment. Um, the clips are visualized and then the treatment is provided um, with, with sort of uh, confidence that we'll get a good response. Uh, this is another patient um, showing us how, you know, the same kind of planning that's done that goes on. Um, you, you sort of decide and then the you know a lot of the times you get you know i think we've got something like 95 to 97 percent success rate so it's pretty good results with proton beam um another example with the cholestered melanoma treated with proton beam um this one we could actually preserve significant vision you can see the tumor is coming close to the fovea but just by contouring the uh, uh putting a notch around the macular area We've got good preservation of the fovea with good central visual acuity. Um, here's another good example, really. The tumor is just at the edge of the fovea, as you can see. Um, and five years post-proton beam has got vision of 6.9. And again, 10 years post-proton is still got 6.9 vision. Um, so there are certain cases and where, where proton therapy may be 
better in terms of visual preservation, especially compared to stereotactic. Obviously, there are complications, lash loss if the radiation field, if the lids involve the radiation field, exposure of the markers, if the tumor is anterior, then risk of rubiosis, uh, risk of toxic tumor syndrome, and in, in around 2 to 3% failure of treatment with then, you know, with treatment failures, clearly there's an increased risk of metastasis. Enucleation, it's only, you know, rare cases, larger tumors, untreatable by conservative methods, patient preference. Uh, just a quick example, young lad with uh, ocular melanocytosis, uh, you can see the left pupil is a different color, large tumor in the eye. Um, you can even see through the slit lamp, uh, a necrotic tumor and really no other option than removing it. So when would we choose a proton beam? Uh, well, if we can't put a plaque on, basically, if you like visual preservation, anterior located tumors, but you have to be careful. They, you know, because of the time it takes for us to insert the markers, then do the planning, then the simulation, and only then the fractionated treatment. Uh, avoid treating rapidly growing tumors, and clearly, patients uh, need to be motivated to go through the whole process and happy to travel to a different, send, you know, different hospital for the treatment. So I hope it was useful. Thank you very much again, Claire. And uh, it's nice to see so many friendly faces in the attendees. Thank and um, I really enjoyed all the talks. Thank you. Thanks, Rod. Thanks very much, Sachin. Okay. Do you mute, Claire? Um, I'm on mute. Do you? We've got some questions in our chat. I'm not sure if there's any from the audience. So there's a question for for Lottie. Um, Lottie, what dose should we be giving prescribing to the apex? And Claire, maybe you'll have an opinion too. Sorry, I'm sure Claire will have an opinion too. I guess it's like any other radiation oncology. You look at the likelihood of tumor control versus the likelihood of toxicity, and you, you try and work out what's best for the patient. I think whatever dose we prescribe, we should be basing it on um, the known dose response. Yeah. Back on mute, Claire. Muted, get unmuted. I think the challenge is that there's a very large range of doses that are used and all regarded as standard. So that the proton dose, which is actually you know, at least double the biologic dose that's used routinely in plaque. And there are some series with quite low doses in plaque that seem to be quite effective. And so and this comes down to the detail that you've been looking at, Lottie, around how is the dose actually dis prescribed and distributed in the tumour. And um, I don't know, but I hope the next phase of the sort of work that you're doing, Lottie, would be to try to get a better handle on standardisation and maybe more, you know, prospective databases like are trying to be put together to really understand this a bit better, because I think dose response in this disease is very poorly understood. In addition, we have very little biologic data underpinning that. So the difference in response of BAP1 muted, mutated tumours compared to non-mutated tumours, for example, is really not described. I think it's an area that we need to work on to help refine a better um, treatment in a more biologically driven way. Yeah, and I think compounding that difficulty is that more than 80% of clinics calculate their doses using an in-house made Excel spreadsheet. They could be full of mistakes. There's no standardizing that. And generally, the calculations assume a central plaque placement, which isn't always what happens in the clinic. So very often, I suspect the reported doses aren't quite the actual doses, just to you know make that harder. Sachin, you... Um, your your centre treats with all these different modalities and quite a high proportion with it. Have you found that the patients uh, prefer one or the other? Or if you, if patient experience, how does it differ? Yeah, I think, I mean, you're right. I think um, um, a lot of patients now are much more aware of the different treatment modalities. We have a patient support group called Ocumel who often get involved uh, with their discussion. Um, the patients, uh, the choice of treatment often depends on their personal circumstances, really. I think a, a lot of sort of patients from, say, the Northeast uh, with, uh, or parts which are underprivileged really would like to leave the decision to us, while someone coming from a much more sort of uh, affluent part of the country that want to be really involved with the decision. Um, 
it also depends on their family circumstances, whether they wish to travel to a different center. A lot of the time, it's more to do with, you know, what, what the moment we say that whichever treatment we give, the risk of uh, it, you know, the chance of it working is similar. And then one treatment is no better than the other in preventing metastasis. They are then happy to go for whatever treatment uh, we, we would recommend them. Um, it, again, a, a lot of, if you have patients who are, who are, have underlying psychological issues, sometimes they find that removing the eye works better for them in terms of preventing further trauma and stress. Um, so it's very different. Every, every patient is different and we just sort of use an MDT approach to have a chat with them. Um, the idea of stereotactic works very well for them because they feel it's all done in one day. So, you know, it, it, it again is, is very variable. Thanks. I've just, there's a few questions that have come up now that we might try to address specifically. Um, it's a generic one, which I think will come to you though, Sachin, is how often do you follow up after a person has been exposed to radiation therapy? <laughs> so um, we follow the patients up uh, four monthly for the first year and then six monthly for up to five years. And then we'll refer um, the patient to the local unit. Though having said that, a number of follow up, a number of patients who are, uh, you know, in our follow up sort of cohort are increasing. So we're now sharing some of the follow ups as two years with the local ophthalmologist. At two years, we know whether the tumor is uh, responded to the radiation, and then beyond that, we will be looking for radiation retinopathy, optic neuropathy, or you know, cataract glaucoma, and then we just ask our referring ophthalmologist to look for those complications and then manage them if required. We don't, I mean, compared to say Paul Finger, who uses a lot of uh, intravitreal avastin to treat radiation maculopathy, we, don't, we tend to, don't tend to use that in UK as much. So, Rod, do you want to ask a question? I'm handing over to you. There's a little list there still. I if you can see the next one. Can you, have you got one there? I can see from Ilya Filipet. What do you think are the main issues in eye plaque, QA and dosimetry? What could be enhanced? That's for you, Lottie, I think. Uh, yeah, so, so I think probably lots of things, but possibly the, the single most important thing that we could, uh, most of us could do better more than 80% of clinics plan their plaque um, treatment times using an Excel spreadsheet. Um, given that there is a, an image-based planning system out there that can be used, but you can import, uh, this is more to the radiation oncologists in the audience, you can import MR, CT, ultrasound, optus images, and you can plan, and you can get dose volume histograms out. I think that's what we should, that probably holds the biggest improvement to clinical practice for most clinics. If we're going to stick with an Excel spreadsheet, it would be great if there was a standardized one. Um, I know Esto is thinking about making one that you could download so that we at least all are using the same thing and it's been independently checked. There are some European um, rules coming into play that might make it difficult for us to share things like that. Esto is looking at that just at the moment. Thanks. And I've got a question for Amanda. Um, so to me, the challenge with the gantry proton is, is, is what's the advantage from a dose distribution point of view over what we can achieve with stereotactic approaches, particularly the gamma knife. Have you, on paper at least, got a plan about how you're going to decide which patients are for which modality? Um, that's a very good question. So I think we're going to lean heavily on the radiation oncology and ophthalmology partnership for that as far as identifying which patients may be better for you know, a head frame versus five days of, of coming back to us for treatment every day. Um, I mean, the dose profiles are quite different. So I mean, if it's a very large tumor and you're having to do 200% in the center or, you know, giving, if it's you know, depending on, on where it's at, you might have a slight advantage to the to the sharp lateral fall off. You know, there is a steep fall off in SRS, but it is not quite as steep as what you would get with protons, and it's definitely not zero uh, behind the behind the protons. So I think we'll we'll do some comparative planning studies for the first few patients. Um, so they'll have to give us a little more than a week <laughs> to uh, to mock up brachytherapy doses, uh, SRS doses, and proton doses to help make that decision for each patient individually. Thank you. Any other questions? I think otherwise we're pretty much on time. 
and we'll be breaking for lunch. And we look forward to seeing you all joining us for the next session, which I can't see my program at the minute. Here we go, which is going to be starting again at two, two o'clock Eastern Australian time. Thanks very much Thank again very to much. our international speakers who've dialed in from all around the world. It's great yeah, to have you joining us and your input. Thanks so much. Enjoy the rest of the meeting.